So, hour two, pull versus pour. False definitions of life and death, understanding our deep commitment to self-enhancement and self-protection and the obstacle this is to our relational holiness. What I want us to walk away with after this hour is more humility about how we can be thinking we are spiritual and godly, while actually the motivation for a lot of what we do or avoid doing is really about pursuing a particular kind of pleasure or avoiding a particular kind of pain, which was shaped in most of us by the time of our adolescence. Facing this can be daunting, but it is worth it because, for one, it provides rich and regular opportunities for repentance and for experiencing God's amazing grace. And two, it grows our dependence on the Holy Spirit, which makes possible the release of his life through us instead of more of the usual. It would be good if each person could leave this hour with a sense of their own unique false deep fisted convictions and we'll talk more about that about the good to pursue and the evil to avoid in life together with a beginning appreciation for the trouble this causes uh, us and others in our relationships i have two favorite questions in the bible i'm a psychologist and psychologists love questions the first one comes in genesis 3 um, after Adam and Eve have sinned and they're hiding from God and God is used to walking with them in the cool of the day and Adam is hiding and he says, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? And I, come on, I, I don't think this is a GPS question of location. God knows exactly where they are. <laughs> but more like, Adam, what's happened? What have you done? Talk to me. And then the, the first question Jesus gives in the, in the gospel, or, or in the gospel of John, does anybody know? Can you think of what Jesus' first question is? His first words in the gospel of John, um, two disciples of John the Baptist, Andrew and one other, are tagging along and he turns and sees them and he says, what do you seek? What are you seeking? I love that question. Can you hear it from him, from the Holy Spirit? What do you seek? What are you seeking? Todd Pickett, the campus pastor and Dean of Spiritual Development at Biola University did a devotional on this during Last Advent, um, the, the Advent Project um, through Biola University is, is a, a great source. Um, they also uh, do one for Lent. But in, in this Advent devotional, he started with a poem that I'm going to read now. And then uh, I'll go into a couple excerpts from his devotional. I think it's very helpful. Clear Night by Charles Wright. Clear night, thumb top of a moon, a black lit sky. Moon fingers lay down their same routine on the side deck and the threshold, the white keys and the black keys. Bird hush and bird song. Acacia flower falls. I want to be bruised by God. I want to be strung up in a strong light and singled out. I want to be stretched like music wrung from a dropped seed. I want to be entered and picked clean. And the wind says, what, to me? And the castor beans with their little earrings of death say, what, to me? And the stars start out on their cold slide through the dark, and the gears notch, and the engines wheel. I'm still quoting from Todd Pickett. We are all moving toward some vision of the good nestled in our hearts, some notion of what we want, however conscious or unconscious. We are led by what we love, 
However, it's important to ask, what do I seek? What do I love? These are good questions because they pull from our hearts the often buried but powerful bundle of desires, hopes, dreams, aspirations, loves, sacred or shallow, that drive our lives. These are good questions also because we become what we love. Watch over your heart with all diligence, says the sage in Proverbs, because whatever is there will simply drive your life for good or for ill. That's Proverbs 4.23. To ask ourselves before God, what do I seek, is often the first step to letting the Holy Spirit work in our deep for the first time or the thousandth time. In the words of the speaker in the poem, Clear Night, it's a question that can pick us clean. What do I love? What do I seek? I'd like to open in prayer. Uh, this is the, the prayer at the close of Todd Pickett's devotion. Holy Spirit, you who minister the presence of Jesus to us, open our hearts. Show us without fear the things that we seek. For each good object of our desire, may we celebrate and give you thanks. Purge from us those seekings that lead us astray. Above all, rekindle in us the desire to seek Jesus and his kingdom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, a lot of what I share uh, this hour comes from Larry Crabb and also from Reverend Kent Denlinger, who Larry mentors. Kent and particularly his wife, Carla, have mentored me for the last 10 years in my spiritual formation. Do you have a mentor or a spiritual director, someone discipling you, somebody where you say, I'd give anything to know Christ like they do? I can't imagine what the last 10 years of my life would be without Carla and Kent and Larry. Actually, I can't imagine, and I shudder. I'm so grateful. This hour, we're going to talk about one aspect of the fall and where we get our wrong-headed notions of what to seek, false ideas of the good to pursue and the evil to avoid. Let's look together at Genesis 2, 16 to 17. Deacon Marion. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So, What's wrong with knowing good and evil? What's the problem? What's the big deal? It's about independently deciding for myself what's good for me and what's bad for me based on my own experience instead of from relationship with God through his word. How do you find, define good and evil Really, how do you define life and death, what you're seeking and what you're afraid of and need to avoid at all costs? From the fields of counseling and spiritual direction and from common sense observation of ourselves and other people, we see that since Adam and Eve's rebellion in the garden, people form their own ideas of what life is, what, what's good for them and what death is or what's bad for them by the teenage years, what's good and what's evil for them based on our own experiences, not based on God and his word. How does this work? What I'm about to share has made spiritual direction and counseling a, a lot simpler, a lot less mysterious, not, not simple or not <laughs> absent mystery, but easier to approach. Um, False definitions of life or good. Our early, best, or most intense positive experiences where we say, this is life. This is what I've always wanted. I'll never get enough of this. And we kind of 
uh, clench our fists around it. When uh, when we buy something nice or, or, or get lost in a craft or a sport, when someone is attracted to us or we finally get the attention and acceptance that we crave, these are positive things. It's what we do with them that can become the problem. Kent Denlinger coined this, this term, deep-fisted convictions. And it's good to <laughs> make a fist <laughs> talking about it. The, the conviction in my, in my heart and my soul when I'm in the middle of those, that positive experience is to grasp onto it and say, I'll do whatever I need to do to get this feeling and reproduce it over and over as much as I can the rest of my life. Again, that's a, that's a subconscious usually feeling uh, or, or conviction or, or declaration, but it's very powerful and uh, has far reaching implications in our soul. When I was 12 years old, my father, who uh, his, his um, professional career life was in aviation, my father built a, an experimental aircraft, uh, Thorpe T-18, there, that's it there, in our garage. Side-by-side um, -side aluminum plane, he, he bought the plans and I got to help him build it. And we finished it, obviously, and it flew. He used a test pilot to, to fly it the first few hours, but um, we got to fly it. And he would take me out over um, the LA area and up into the, uh, above the mountains that uh, circle the Los Angeles Basin. Some of those mountains are 10,000 feet. And one day we were flying up over the mountains in blue sky actually with billowy white clouds. And he decides to do something wild. And he goes, watch this, Bri. And we're up, up at about 15,000 feet. And he dips the plane nose down and down and down until it's, we're going straight down. We're looking forward and looking at the ground and we're picking up speed and we're zooming down. And then he pulls back on, uh, on, on the, the stick and, and converts our direction to up. And the gravity force of that shift was amazing. And now we're going straight up. And he turns off the engine and we continue up until the, the plane just stopped going up and then he tipped it over on its side, and now I'm looking out the side of the plane and looking straight down, and he did the same thing again. Zoom down and up again, and tipped over, and zoom down and up again, and tipped over. And maybe the fourth or fifth time, he's giddy like a kid, and he, he laughs and he says, ha, 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 pretty good, huh, Bri? And yeah, I was terrified and thrilled at the same time. And something deep in me got a hold of me. And I was going, yeah, pretty good indeed. Ah, I love this. And you can imagine, uh, actually, I didn't become a, a, a pilot, but I got into water skiing. And when we moved out to the, the, the capital region of New York State, I, I uh, picked up snowboarding. And guess what I gravitated to? The half pipe. And... In the last 10 years, my only traffic tickets I've received are speeding tickets on the way to a half pipe. Um, it got into my soul. And you can, you can ask yourself, what's yours? What got into your soul as the good to pursue uh, that you would do anything to re repeat and hold on to or make sure you get a dose of regularly? In, in your life. A, a clue is what you tend to think about when you're drifting off to sleep. Not always, but sometimes that can help. Now the, the reciprocal on the, the uh, death side, the negative side, false definitions of death or bad or evil. Our early worst, most painful humiliating or frightening experiences, our wounds can lead us to this place, to, to, to the sense of this is unacceptable, this is death. 
this is what I've always feared. I hate this. It's, it's too much for me. I, I can't stand this. Um, some of you have trauma stories. I, I have a trauma story that got unearthed during my psychotherapy uh, when I was in training to be a psychotherapist. Um, I, I would of, often have shivers and, and feel sh short of breath and, and panicky. And my therapist got me to ask my mother if there were any early experiences where I was uh, traumatized, where, where I was just panicked. And she reluctantly told me of a time when um, the family was driving back from the beach. I was about three years old and I apparently could be a, a terror in the car and I finally fell asleep and we pulled into the garage, which is a, uh, a separate building from the house uh, we were in at the time. And my mother and family left, left me sleeping in the garage and went into the house. And who knows, I have no idea, it probably wasn't that long, but when I woke up, I was, I was by myself in a dark garage no seatbelts at that time, but panicked, could not get myself out of the car and must have believed, you know, I'll be in here the rest of my life and just lost it. And when she came back to check on me, I was, I was just panicked and screaming and crying. And she comforted me the best she could and brought me into the house. But still to this day, I, I can have moments where I feel that um, unable to catch my breath, alone in the dark, inadequate and small and helpless and hopeless feeling, which I hate. And I said, some, at some point deep in my soul, I'll do whatever I need to do to never feel this way again. Sometimes it's, it's abuse uh, where somebody ends up in, in that place. Um, and I've coped with that through the years the best way I can. And I've learned that uh, it's, it's not going to destroy my soul. And it's, it's, it's something that I've learned to, to sit with and pray through and, and trust that God's doing something good in me through it. But the temptation is to make that deep fisted declaration, I'll do whatever I need to do to protect myself and make sure I never feel this way again the rest of my life. And I build my life around ways to avoid that feeling. Those, um, let's see, the, uh, the passages there in Judges and Isaiah are, um, the Judges one is, uh, they all did what was right in their own eyes. And the Isaiah one, Isaiah 53, 6a, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way. And like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. <laughs> and, and another one that goes along with this is Proverbs 16, five. There is a way that seems right to a man or a woman, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. We think, we feel very justified avoiding these experiences and clamoring after the positive ones. And it is, it is not the way to life. It's actually the way to, to death, the way to failing to image or reveal what God is like. On the death side, what's yours? What situation or issue or feeling do you just hate and avoid at any cost and feel justified to do whatever it takes to not have to deal with that or not have to feel that way? That's a, a good question to journal and pray through. The problem, the moral inventory or relational holiness issue is how we treat people when we are living to grasp as much of life as we can, as we define it, and protect ourselves at any cost from our idea of death. We all have wounds, but the real problem here, as far as spiritual formation is concerned, is not how you've been wounded, but how you can, how, not how you have been wounded, or how you can get relief, but how 
your response to the wound has shaped how you relate to other people. As we saw last hour, you are in a story about God, and your calling is to put him on display by how you relate and respond to life's circumstances. And you can't do that if your ruling passion is to make sure you're never hurt again or to reproduce over and over that pleasure that touched that sweet spot in your youth. We are very programmed by the time we enter adulthood and our programming feels right, but it's all wrong. So if these are the false definitions of good and evil or life and death, what are the true ones? How does Jesus define life? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Life is connection with God dependence on him, knowing him and becoming like him. What's the good news? Real life is available every moment of every day. Any, at any point in that, in that orbit around God, any life circumstance, you can know the Father and know the Son. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire. So here, scripture defines what death is, what the the true thing to avoid at all costs. The the only thing you need protection from at any cost is soul destruction, disconnection from God, independence from him, becoming less like him forever, eternal soul destruction. That's death. Death. What's the good news there? The only thing you really need to fear all of your life is already off the table if you've trusted Christ. He took the penalty for that sin, for for our sins. And you, if you believe in Christ and his resurrection power is living within you, you will never taste death. Everything else is just really, 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 really bad pain. And it's not nothing, but it will not destroy you. Um, Let's read Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, Even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. Amen. So even in the worst conceivable circumstance, we have access to him and his leading. That's life, access to him, knowing him better in the middle of life as it is. And we have protection from soul destruction, from true death or evil, because of his right hand laying hold of us and embracing us. Basically, in any conceivable circumstance on the planet, we're good, spiritually speaking, in terms of our our soul. That's the good news of the gospel. We're bookended. We're protected from the only thing we need truly to fear, and we have life itself available to us every moment of every day. Hope right now, any time, in any circumstance. All of this is without our circumstances needing to change. It's not, Lord, get me out of this life. It's, Lord, help me to find you and know you better right where you've placed me. Pursuing our false definitions of life and death, um, we can be saying to God, God, you're not life and you're not protecting us from death. Life is you giving me this, or life is you protecting me from that. And if you don't cooperate, I'll arrange it myself. And we feel very justified living that way because it feels so right and feels so natural. Um, 
can't be right if it feels, it can't be wrong if it feels so right, right? Like Nancy Boo. Um, but that's not the case. It, it, it feels justified. It feels right and natural, but it, it's all wrong. Let's look at Jeremiah 2.13 for uh, more insight into the contrast. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Why does God refer to himself as the fountain of living water? Similar to Jesus in the Gospel of John, where he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. We are designed to run on the Father and on the Son by the Spirit and through their word. Then we become like him in pouring into others, little Christs. Every person has to worship something. And God's protection from real death and his offer of himself every moment for true life doesn't cut it for most of us most of the time. We want something that gets rid of the pain or makes us feel alive and good. What are these things? You fill it in for yourself, our addiction, our drug of choice, a man, a woman, how I feel when I make people laugh, how I feel when I get it right, or have money, or my fishing rod, or a car, or a snowboard, or a new pair of shoes. Even our children or our spouse can become an idol, a broken system. For some, it's the church or the way you do ministry because of how it makes you feel. Broken cisterns, deep-fisted convictions. These are our false gods. It, it can become a master passion of our life. Motivating drives which justify doing whatever we need to do to protect ourselves from our definition of death and indulge ourselves in our definition of life. That idea you came up with that now controls your life, that you came up with on your own, apart from God, about what life was going to be like and how you were going to survive. It seems like a small thing, but it's not. We all do it, and it's the cause of a lot of our own suffering and the suffering of the people closest to us that we're supposed to love the best. We forsake God and instead trust our own independent rebellious ideas of death and life, which can't hold water. They're broken cisterns. That passage in Jeremiah 2, we, we walk right past the, the source of living water and and dig for ourselves, create for ourselves broken cisterns according to our wrong-headed, deep-fisted convictions about life and death and good and evil. Now ask yourself, when you are living life controlled by, how, by your broken cistern or your deep-fisted conviction, how do you relate to the people closest to you? Are you a fountain of living water pouring life into them? Or are you pulling or sucking life out of them? What's your relational motivation? Are you curved in, as Luther defines sin? Are you curved, or are you curved outward toward others like the Trinity? I want to start talking about pull versus pour. There's curved in and curved out. Sorry for my stick figures. <laughs> Are we a generous giver, curved out, or are we a greedy consumer, sucking, pulling in? Grateful receiver versus entitled taker, connected versus isolated, cooperative versus competitive. Do we have freedom to risk 
or are we self-protective, pulling in? Are we worshipful or are we addicted? Intimate or independent? This can be very obvious and blatant, or it can be very subtle. But divine life is curved outward. God gives and pours. But when we're living to reproduce that unique pleasure or protect ourselves from that unique pain, we're going to have a characteristic pull in our relationships that demands or, or robs something costly from the people that we're closest to. Go a little bit deeper. This again comes from Kent Denlinger. Um, if we imagine this as a diagram of the soul on the surface level, what we're often most aware of is our pain and wanting relief for our pain. And we think life is about getting relief uh, for pain in the body or, or psychological pain. Just below that is our behaviors and our, our focus in, in, in terms of right or wrong could be the rules and what we do uh, to keep the rules or break the rules. And when we break the rules, uh, we don't feel too bad about it. We, if we more, we feel bad if we get caught. Um, we feel justified often and justify what we do. And that contrast that we talked about before in, in Hosea is, is kind of obvious. Here's the pro prophet speaking, woe to them for they have strayed from me. Destruction is theirs for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. And here it is. And they do not cry to me from their heart when they wail on their beds for the sake of grain and new wine. They assemble themselves. They turn away from me. The, the contrast there is, is between um, wailing from our bed, complaining about being caught or suffering the consequences of our, of our sin, um, sort, of, sort of like uh, getting, getting caught driving five miles too fast in a 40-mile-an-hour a, a, 40, 40 mile an hour, uh, speed zone and you got caught for, a, for driving 45 or something. You don't feel very bad about it. Um, and, and you feel justified. I was late or, or, or whatever. But let's go a little bit deeper now. When, when we are living controlled by our broken sister and idol, how do the people closest to us feel? Loved or used? <laughs> Sucked dry and invisible. What is your impact on them when you forsake God and live your life to get what you think you need to protect yourself and to feel good. What if we compare the direction and impact of our relational energy with what we see of Jesus and the gospel? Now we're getting to where we might cry from our heart rather than wail from our bed. It's, it's, it's not a lot of fun, but it's good for our souls. If we look at how Jesus relates in the gospels, um, Again, this comes from Larry Crabb, kind of condensing down the way he relates to, to these statements. Jesus in the Gospels always moves toward others for their good at any cost to himself, think the cross, to please and to reveal the Father. He moves toward others for their good at any cost to himself to please and to reveal the Father. Now compare his movement. He's the fountain of living water and how he relates to thirsty souls with the way you and I often relate when pursuing our wrong-headed ideas of how to feel good or how to protect ourselves. Pursuing broken cisterns, we relate to others for our good at any cost to them, displeasing God and misrepresenting him. Yeah, not too fun to look at. Look with me at this next level. Beneath the body and our pain and our behavioral sins to our beliefs and convictions that are deeply held in our souls. 
the broken cisterns level. And some examples of what could convict you deeper and help you cry from your heart rather than just wailing from your bed. And we won't go to extreme examples here, although with my half pipe addiction and my G-force turns addiction, I've hurt my wife many, many a time by being absorbed in that and putting her to the side or she's felt second in my life or, 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 or worse uh, many times as I pursue those things. But this one's more subtle. Listen to my religious way of numbing my pain while making sure life didn't demand too much of me. To not feel frightened and helpless and alone on an ordinary day before work I used to not only dutifully have my morning devotion time with God, I would spend extra time in it. So I could feel about myself that I was spiritual and exceptional. All the while being late to breakfast with my family and missing a time I, would, I had promised Jean many, many times, my wife Jean, to spend with her praying before I went off to work every day thinking I was extra spiritual for spending extra time with God and exceptional in my devotional life, I was a no-show to my family while feeling good about myself as a Christian. Ouch. We are naturally more motivated to feel good than to be good. And pursuing our own definitions of life and death is how we keep feeling good about ourselves while we look nothing like Christ. C.S. Lewis says, this is why a smug, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church might be closer to hell than a prostitute. That could get me crying from my heart. But when we confess and repent at this level, not about the pain, not about looking bad, breaking rules, but honestly feeling bad about how how unlike Jesus we are in our closest relationships with the people who are depending on us the most, something surprising happens. This level isn't so much about behavioral sins. There are no rules against spending extra time in devotions, but it's, these are relational sins based on a deep selfish soul compulsion about how we're going to make it on our own in this life when we finally see what it costs the people we love when we chase our broken cisterns, how the people closest to us become invisible to us and we are no-shows in their lives, now we can see how very unlike Jesus we are. And now there can be some crying from our hearts toward God. Then the dynamic we talked about in seminar one kicks in. Um, and I shared last seminar my favorite verse in the whole Bible, Isaiah 57, 15, which says, for, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the heart that's lowly, in order to revive the heart that's contrite and broken. What's possible when you live forgiven and revived, when you know you've been a rebel, navigating life on your own terms with a lot of unloved people in your wake, and you know the Lord sees you as you are and forgives you and still wants you and loves you? What's possible when you realize he's already protected you from the only thing you really need to fear and guaranteed his life-giving presence every moment of every day so you can know him more and become more like him no matter what your circumstances, you start to realize there is something more to life than your cistern. You start to feel a stirring inside that's deeper than your sin. Your new heart, filled with the Holy Spirit, has living water. Your alive spirit that's deeper than your sin wants to pour life into others to move toward them for their good, even when it costs you dearly to please and to reveal something of what God is like to them through you. There is a release of your desire and ability to love, which would never come by just trying harder. 
You can't make this happen yourself. This is a major way deep transformation takes place. And it helps to remove the stuff in the way of what's deeper in us, the life of the spirit. I'm going to read a quote from Larry Crabb's book, A Different Kind of Happiness, the joy that that comes from self-sacrificial love. He says, it is repentance that releases the life of God from my spirit indwelt nature. It's repentance that releases the life of God from my spirit indwelt nature that frees me up to offer a love that resembles the love of Jesus. I give what is good through my words and deeds as I reflect on my motivation and repent of the self-centeredness that is exposed. It is then that the love of Jesus trickles out of my redeemed heart into another. Sometimes it flows. I hope that speaks to you. We have a battle going on. Battle within between independent self and our relational soul. And the left broken cisterns and deep-fisted convictions seduce me to live for self-protection and self-enhancement, curving inward, curving me inward as an independent self. On the right, repentance accesses the spirit in me from which flows the life of the Trinity, curving me outward in self-sacrificial, other-enhancing love as a relational soul. I want to allow time for prayer, and um, we will will get there. If there are questions or uh, confusion, comments, uh, please feel free to chat those in. Um, I would like to see what this stirs up in you and respond as I can. Earlier, I mentioned Larry Crabb's quote, embedded in every circumstance is the possibility of a response that delights the heart of God. Mostly, I think first anyway, that response that delights the heart of God is a cry from our hearts. Have mercy on me, the sinner. I see you finally, how unlike you I am. I'm such a mess. God forgive me. But it doesn't take long to get to that point of amazing grace and an excitement about depending on him for what he wants to do in and through us because he does forgive us. And he seems to think he can do something with us. That's amazing. You will never get over amazement at that. But it starts here. This is a uh, Rembrandt's portrayal of the prodigal son. Humble, repentant, broken. It starts here. This is where the life of God flows into us. This is where his life gets released out of us. I had the sense with the prodigal son that at some point, deep within him, the rest of his life, if he was a real person, he never got up from his knees in the father's lap here. And at, at some point, deep in our souls, can, can we live here in this amazement at God's seeing us as we are, forgiving us, loving us, and wanting us, and, and using us to put him on display through us. This is the engine. This is the fuel for spiritual formation. There may be questions that you have, thoughts or comments. I'm happy to hear those. But I hope also a cry from your heart is forming in your soul. Cries like, forgive me, Lord, when I go to my broken cistern for life that's only found in you. Prayers like, Forgive me more for the way I treat people when I keep chasing a feeling or keep protecting myself from pain that, I, that I've called unsurvivable when you took far worse pain for me 
and you make anything that I go through in life survivable. Nothing will destroy my eternal soul now. Forgive me for making protecting myself more important than putting you on display. You are enough for me, Lord. You are more than enough. I don't need my circumstances to change. I don't need, you know, fill it in, whatever your, your, your idol is, my snowboard, my fishing rod, everybody to like me or to never feel frightened or alone or betrayed or in, in order to feel whole and alive and well in my soul. I just need you. Help me right where I am to just want to know you better and help me to respond to my current trial current temptation or challenge or struggle in a way that pleases you and in a way that shows something of what you're like to the people around me that need to see you through me. I hope and, and pray the Spirit enlivens that kind of uh, cry in your soul, cry in your heart toward your good God. Do we have any uh, thoughts or questions or comments? Okay, here's something. Mm -hmm. I had a spiritual director once, but he betrayed my confidence. Although I would love to have one, although I would love to have one-on-one -on -one spiritual direction, as you say, don't know that I would trust someone in authority to guide me. Yeah, that's a great question or comment. It goes, it goes on, I mm -hmm. do get direction from other sources, books about the saints, homilies, these seminars, retreats, webinars, etc., but feel sad and know I have forgiven this person and still have a relationship with him, but would never trust him for he is such a gossip. He is a priest. He gets very upset when I don't do things as he wants, and I am still having issues. But as I listen to you, you say it will not destroy me. And I know I have authority issues since a child, and it's probably making this issue bigger than it is. This can't be right because it feels so wrong, opposite of what you just said. I just want to be free of it all and don't know how to do it. I love Henri Nouwen's book on the prodigal son. Henri Nouwen is one of my spiritual directors through his books. Thank you, dear sister, I assume, uh, uh, for your comments and sharing your struggle. Uh, I have no easy answer for you. I, I hope that's obvious. Um, I appreciate uh, what you're going through and the, the wrestling that you're doing right now. Uh, and yes, Henri Nouwen is a wonderful spiritual director and, and many uh, people that have gone before us that we can read and, and review things that they've said and hold uh, the things that the Holy Spirit highlights dear to our hearts. Um, I, I appreciate the, the, your courage to wrestle with um, that thought that your soul hasn't been destroyed by the inappropriate uh, treatment in, in not honoring your confidences. It's certainly painful, very, very, very deep pain, uh, but to wrestle with how to, to go on and how even this could be used in, in your soul to help you to know God even better and, and trust that he can redeem even this for, for his good as you continue to be faithful in your life, you, you've already worked to forgive, and that's amazing already. But, but to trust is a, a long journey, and I, um, I, I respect that work that you're doing. That's about all I could say about that at this point, except uh, perseverance with the wound and trusting that God intends to do something good through it in, in the long run is um, will be fueled by the Holy Spirit. Bless you. Um, 
one attendee says, Henri Nouwen's Return of the Prodigal Son is the best book, in my opinion, for dealing with forgiveness. Um, and then the other question is, how can we find a spiritual director? Um, that's, I thank you for both comments. The, uh, the Return of the Prodigal is, uh, um, has on its cover that uh, Rembrandt portrait that we looked at just a little bit earlier and um, is, is a good guide in many ways to understand uh, both the, the uh, re rebellious son and the, the dutiful son that stayed and, and beyond that to, to what is put on display of, of the Father's heart, God himself, and how he is helping us to become more like him through everything that he allows in our life. Um, the, the challenge of finding a, a spiritual director um, is uh, depend, depends on where, where you, you, you live and your spiritual community, but something that starts with prayer if, if, if God is stirring that in your heart, that you, you bring that to him and, and ask him to reveal somebody that he would want to help you journey in your spiritual formation. Certainly somebody that helps you uh, to look for the life of the spirit in your circumstances and, and not just uh, teaching content or um, a, a program that somebody that will walk with you humbly share their life and where they're struggling and where they're learning and growing Christ the King I think has resources that I would recommend that you um, access through Father Mark or Deacon Marion I, I know that um, the website I mentioned from Larry Crabb's larger story it, uh, connects to some spiritual directors that are available through them and you, you might ask if, if you're in a spiritual community with a, a pastor um, who your pastor or, or priest would, would re recommend um, but it, it's a it's something that needs to be bathed in prayer and you, you need to know that this is somebody that knows the Lord like you want to be able to know the Lord and has has time and an affection or affinity with, with you that uh, uh, they, they would like to uh, make time available for journeying with you. I think that's about all the time we have for this hour. We're going to take another five minute break and then we will finish with hour three on the exchange life. God bless you. Talk to you in a few minutes. <laughs>